Anybody to turn your Bibles with me, please, to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to continue in our series on Philippians. Rejoice! We spoke last week about rejoicing completely. This week, we want to talk about rejoicing in God's will and in God's work. Now, sometimes, um, whenever our circumstances are maybe more difficult than we would like them to be, we have to remember that, oh, how we love Jesus because he first loved us. Everything that happens in our lives is a result of his plan for us, of his will in us, and his work in us. The Apostle Paul, in fact, had good reason to, and, and a good background, actually, to, uh, to speak on this topic uh, because, uh, well, we find out that uh, he had some uh, unpleasant experiences, unpleasant circumstances. Even as he was writing this in, in prison, uh, he had suffered a lot for the sake of the gospel. And we, we've covered that over the last uh, few Sundays. But Paul wants to encourage uh, the people he's writing to in Philippi to continue to rejoice as they see God's will unfold and as they see God at work in their lives. Well, you might be asking, how then do we know what God's will is and how then do we know that God is at work in our lives? Well, thankfully, the Apostle Paul has some uh, ideas for us along those lines. Now, one of the things that uh, sometimes we like to do is when we're trying to figure something out, and this is a good way to even get into studying God's Word together, you ask yourself, you know, okay, it's kind of back to school, kind of back to English class, you know, the five W's and the H, who, what, when, where, why, and how, okay? That's how we're going to take a look at this passage this morning. So as we dig in, uh, if you have an outline in front of you, I've got the order in which we're going to do it. Uh, we're going to start with the who, and that's because that's where Paul starts. Look at verse 12. Well, we see my favorite word in all Scripture there, therefore. And, you know, every time we see the word therefore, we ask ourselves that deep theological question, what is it there for? Well, in light of what? In light of the previous verses that talk to us about who Jesus is, God the Son, the Son of God, fully God, fully man, and what he did in laying aside the prerogatives of his deity in order to bear our sin and die on the cross that we might be saved. Wow. Uh, in light of that, in light of what Jesus did for us, and in light of the fact that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, therefore, my dear friends, that's who he says, therefore, my dear friends, that's the who. He's not talking to strangers. He's not talking about people with whom he might be, you know, maybe a little bit acquainted he says, my dear friends, or your translation might even have the word beloved, because that's the word that uh, is best translated here, beloved. I had a preacher friend, one of my mentors, his name was John, John Measel. He was uh, a pastor for many years. He actually was born and raised in Racine, um, and he ended up in Africa as a missionary, uh, came back as an executive with the mission organization he was with uh, in a town adjacent to where I grew up, was a part of uh, the church I grew up in, uh, did some preaching along the way, and, and took this young punk under his wing uh, and, uh, and began to pour into him a little bit. Uh, John, um, he, as he preached, he would use the word beloved often in his preaching as he was communicating, as he was encouraging, as he was imploring, as he was exhorting, as he was uh, challenging the people in the congregation, he would use beloved. He would use that word. And uh, the more I grow as a preacher, the more I, I realize the depth of relationship that John, not as a paid staff person, 
but as, uh, as an elder in that church, but very well qualified to, to preach God's word, uh, he had invested in the lives of the people in my home church, and he invested in me too. Therefore, beloved, therefore, my dear friends, that's the who. How do we look at the people who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ? How do we look at those who have bowed their knee at the name of Jesus? How do we observe, how do we look at those whose tongues have confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father? We need to look at them as beloved. Because you know what? If we don't, who will? Popular culture calls us haters. The media isn't all that enthralled with us either. They'd rather cut us down. But you know what? We need to look at one another who are in Christ as very much loved, dear friends. I think that's why it hurts so much when sometimes people go home to be with the Lord that we've known for many, many, many years, or maybe we haven't known for very long, but they're brothers and sisters in Christ. And now they've, you know, they, they achieve the, the weight of eternal, eternal glory. But you know what? There's a hole in our hearts because we love one another so much. Therefore, my dear beloved friends, well, that's the who. What about the what? Paul goes on and says, as you have always obeyed. Now, uh, my brother over here, he and I refer to that as what? The, the, big, o the big O word. The O word. Uh, you know, Paul uses this word a lot through Scripture. And as you have obeyed, but look at the way he modified it. He says, as you have always obeyed. As you have always obeyed. Well, that therefore, that was uh, in the uh, first part of this verse, um, he modifies uh, the, the who puts it there, but that therefore has to go with the action word of obey. As you have always obeyed. Well, if we go back to verse 8, what do we see about our example? Jesus, he was obedient to death, even death on a cross. And he, what? he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that's above every name. See, Jesus is our example. We sometimes look at others as examples of obedience. We can, we can put people up as, oh, look at that person who followed Jesus all the way to Africa. Please don't send me to Africa. You know, you might have heard that song. We set them up as examples. But our biggest example, our best example, really our, our preeminent example needs to be Jesus. Jesus is our example. Now, how do we obey? I mean, how do we define this big O word? If Jesus is our example, here's, here's a definition of obedience. Feel free to use it on your children and grandchildren. It's heeding the authority of the one speaking and acting accordingly. If you think about it, that's what obedience is. We are required to heed authority. Now, those who are in authority have been placed there by whom? They've been placed in authority by the Lord himself. And that's why later on, uh, well, earlier on, actually in Romans, Paul says, you know, obey those who are placed over you. In Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says, you know what? Obey your leaders whom God has put over you. Paul says, Beloved, as you have always obeyed, in other words, as you have heeded the authority of the one speaking, and you're acting accordingly. Well, we all know about the acting accordingly, right? Or maybe we, maybe we understand better the uh, not acting accordingly. What happens when we disobey? When we don't act accordingly, then there is accountability. It's always better to heed the authority of the one speaking and acting accordingly. You've heard children say, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I've, I've had it said to me. <laughs> and sometimes when that person was a child and I was an adult, that wasn't quite right. But uh, uh, anyway, that authority was exercised and established. But the acting accordingly thing, um, yeah, that's a choice. It's a matter of the will. When we align our will with God's will, then we heed his authority and we act accordingly. Take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10 with me. Let's turn there for just a minute. And we're going to look there again for a minute, but then we're going to come back later on. But I wanted to point out in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5, one of the keys to obedience. If we understand obedience in a biblical manner, this is what uh, it looks like. It's not 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse. Why did I? Okay. Ah, I hear it when a blank comes. All right. That's my homework. <laughs> i got to find where that verse is because I'm not going to take too much time here. Th this idea of making uh, obedience to Christ more forefront in our minds. The verse that talks about taking every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. That's the verse that we're talking about here. How do we do that? What is it, John? It, it is part of Oh, you know what? I was in 2 Corinthians chapter. I was in the wrong chapter. <laughs> right book, wrong chapter. I was at 510. I said, that's not right. Here we go. We demolish arguments, every pretension that sets itself, up, sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. There we go. Yeah, every thought, captive. Now, for Paul to uh, write that in 2 Corinthians is one thing. But then for us to take a look at it from the perspective of his writing to the Philippian people, um, you know, this matter of obedience led Paul to being taken captive. So this idea of always obedience is something Paul lived out throughout his life. Now, um, then we see uh, moving on as you have always obeyed. Oh, okay. Well, where does that always come into play here? Uh, Paul was brilliant. I have no doubt of that. His command of the Hebrew and the Greek was, was beyond uh, the great scholars of that day. Um, if you would do a literal interpretation of the words Paul uses here, always would be every when. So sometimes we hear uh, in popular vernacular, whatever, you know. Well, this could be a when. When do we obey? We obey every when. Every when. So whenever isn't you know isn't just whenever like whatever it's every when every opportunity we have to obey Jesus as our example heed his authority taking every thought captive we do that always as you have obeyed every opportunity that you have had then we go on and we see the where part of this not only in my presence, okay, you know, when, when Paul showed up, everybody put on their Sunday best. They were in their best behavior. They were there. They were all smiles, right? This idea of eye service in my presence. Sometimes when I visit people and there are family members there and I'm introduced as the pastor, 
and they don't know me, we haven't met, they get, they get a little uncomfortable. And, uh, oh, oh, the pastor's here. Uh, I better, better, watch my, better watch what I say. Better watch how I act and all that. And, uh, you know, sometimes I, as I meet with people, they say, pardon my French. And uh, I, I, I studied French, and some of the words that they use, I, I, I know the French words for those words, uh, not because I wanted to, but because I was curious one day and how to respond to people who, anyway, that's enough of that. This eye service, putting on a good show for people to make sure they think the best of you. Well, Paul says, yeah, you've done this in my presence. You've obeyed Jesus in my presence, but you know what? Now much more without my presence, without this eye service. You need to obey, and you're doing it. That's the word that Paul's getting back. And this is a, not as much an indictment as it is an encouragement. The word that Paul gets back is that they're doing a good job at living their life for the Lord. So there's the who, there's the what, and now we get to the where. With and without eye service. So how then do we rejoice in God's will and work? Well, the next words in verse 12 are continue. Continue to what? Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Well, let's go back to this working out our salvation. Some of us uh, have worked out in the past. Some of us, our workout days are behind us. Some of us, our workout days need to resume. I, I need to get back to that a little bit. Boy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you got that right. The heart is willing and the flesh is weak. Uh, <laughs> but you know, it says here, if we dig into this a little bit, we see that we're to work out our, an, an untranslatable particle here is work out your own salvation. So many times we want to help people work out their salvation, but when we think about it, we really need to be working on our own salvation in order to accomplish God's will, but also the idea of finishing well comes through here. Finishing well. We want to finish well the course that God has marked out for us. So we need to continue to work out our own salvation so that we might finish well, looking forward to that well done, thou good and faithful servant. Finishing well. It's a concept that we need to uh, continue to work on. We have not arrived until we see Jesus face to face. But then how do we do it? As we work in our salvation, we do it with fear and trembling. Now, sometimes uh, we're misunderstood, us preachers, when we talk about fear and trembling. It's the, it's the shivering down and buckling down and, and, and just being scared and want, 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 wanting to hide a little bit. No, it's not, it's not terror. It's not about what people might do to us. But we need to live our lives. I, I like this word circumspectly circumspectly, when we think of a circumference of a sphere looking all around, spect, circum, all around spect, these are my spectacles, I know you're all out there, but I can't see you until I put my spectacles back on, I can see clearly all around me, that's how we work out our salvation, we keep our eyes open, and we look all around at what God is doing in us, we work our salvation with fear and trembling circumspectly, because we want to please the Lord and because we want to um, acknowledge God's work in us. But that's the why. We'll get to that in a minute. Look at verse 14. There's another thing here. There's a do everything. Now, there, there's a clear instruction. Do everything without complaining. Hmm. Complaining. We hear a lot of complaining, don't we? Uh, you know, sometimes we just want to turn, turn that, that box off or, you know, just leave this device somewhere else because every time we pull up a search engine, it's all these complaints about stuff. 
complaining in Paul's mind was even a little deeper. Murmuring or the secret displeasure, keeping it private and not making it public. Oh boy, the complaining about the world gets very loud. There is complaining about truth and the world gets very loud. Paul says, do everything without complaining. In other words, without murmuring or secret displeasure, you know, stepping into a corner, turning your back to people and grumbling. Some of us, when our kids were younger, remember Rob Evans, the donut man. And he had the song, do everything without complaining, do everything, oh, here we go, without arguing that you may become what? Blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a depraved uh, generation. But we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. This idea of arguing, arguing is a dispute. It's a debate. It's rationalizing in, dis, in, in dialogue in a discordant dialogue. Now, yes, we do need to defend the faith. We do need to know ap apologetics. But we can disagree without being disagreeable, without arguing, without disputing, without rationalizing in dialogue. No, we just need to speak the truth and speak the truth in love. Do everything without complaining. Do everything without arguing. And the next thing we see here is uh, in verses, the end of verse 15 into verse 16. We need to shine like stars in the universe, holding forth the word of God. This idea about shining like stars takes it way back to creation. When God put the lights in the sky, he caused them to shine. He caused them to appear. That's how we are to shine. Shine at God's instruction. Shine the glory of God. Shine forth the word of life. When we work out our salvation, when we aim to finish well, we need to do it looking all around us, watching what God is doing, aligning with him in it, doing what we do without complaining, no matter what we're going through, let's keep our talking with the Lord. We know David the psalmist, he did a lot of complaining to the Lord. He poured out his heart before God. Save it for that. Do everything without arguing and shine like stars. Shine like stars as we hold forth the word of life. We can beat people over the head with the gospel, with the Bible. We can be oppositional. We can be defiant. We can be sharp. We can be even angry. Or we can love people with the love of the Lord. We can hold forth the word of life. We can speak the truth in love. And we can work out our own salvation, working on finishing well, but also being one who is... A mouthpiece. Now, let's begin to pull it together here a little bit. What about the when? The when is now. Well, it could have been back when Paul was writing this to the people in Philippi. But even now, look how he describes the world in which he lived, the world in which we are living. Back up into verse 15. We may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in what? a crooked and depraved generation. Boy, if the world was crooked and depraved in the first century, and it still is now in the 21st century, wow, wow. Yeah. Well, what does it mean here? How do we interpret what a crooked and depraved generation is. We could look at morality, we could look at economics, we could look at uh, truth, we could look at all kinds of things. That's an application. How do we define it? We could read it this way. Or 
a generation that is perverted. Why? Because it has thoroughly distorted and twisted how things were meant to be. When we look at something that's crooked, we look at something that's depraved, we have to look at the original. God put things forth in an order in which he ordained what is right and what is wrong. A perverted generation distorts it and twists it. Now, think of it this way. Uh, the straightest distance between two points is what? A straight line. Now, we can move off of that line. We can take it, we can twist it, we can turn it. And boy, things can get really a lot more thrilling when we do that, especially if it's an amusement ride, right? Our lives in the truth is not an amusement ride. It's meant for God's glory. It's meant for God's honor. See, when culture in the world takes what God ordained and tries to recreate it so they feel better about what they do that's wrong, it distorts truth and it twists the way we live. It distorts God's will and then changes how we work out our salvation. Hmm. Now, as we live in a crooked and depraved generation, let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And I will actually turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 this time. And look what Paul says here as he speaks about how he lives and especially talking about Corinth remember how depraved and crooked Corinth is by the meekness and gentleness of Christ I appeal to you see this example from the Apostle Paul about how we rejoice in God's will and work and work our salvation without complaining or arguing Look at how he explains this here. By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. I, Paul, who am, quotes, quote, timid when face to face with you, but bold went away, I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be toward some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. Paul was getting some bad press. For though we live in the world... We do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. We'll stop there for just a minute. Don't live by this world's standards. The world says what? You get hit with mud, you throw mud back and make sure your mud is gooier and thicker and grosser. No, we, we, don't, we don't do that. We don't do that. Let's not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Oh, there we go. Don't live by this world's standards. We have divine power to demolish strongholds. How do we get that divine power? We have to arm ourselves with the truth of the sword of the Lord right here in his holy word. We have that. We have divine power. And when we open our mouths, if we're dependent on the Holy Spirit to not complain, to not argue, but to shine like stars, to shine forth the light of God's word, that's the power enabled by the Holy Spirit to demolish these strongholds, arguments and pretensions against the knowledge of God. That's what Paul is talking about in verses 4 and 5. Arguments. No, we don't argue. We demolish arguments. We don't, um, we don't contend on the basis of pretense. We contend on the basis of truth. Pretension sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take every captive thought to make it obedient to Christ. And then we speak forth God's truth. We have divine power. 
Let's rely on that. All right, so why? 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 We got to get back to into verse 15, first part of verse 15. Do everything without arguing or complaining so that you may become blameless and pure children of God. So what about this blameless and pure children of God without fault? That's the goal. We need to honor the Lord Jesus in all that we do. We, as we work out our salvation, our salvation is accomplished by the cleansing blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are blameless, we are pure, but yet we're stuck in this human body and with this stinking, thinking brain that makes us disobey. <laughs> But as we continue to work out our salvation, as we continue to hold out the word of life, as we continue to rejoice in God's will and God's work, we will become blameless and pure, children of God without fault. Why? Back to verse 13. You might notice that I skipped that. Why? Because it's God at work in us. God is at work in us. You think it's work to obey? You think it's work to trust? I think it's harder work for God to work in us. To remind us how much he loves us. God works in us to what? To will and to act according to his good purpose. There's the key to understanding how we can rejoice in God's will and work. We get through the, the who, we have that relationship established with God, and we'll get into that in just a minute. But there is a purpose. Why? We may become blameless and pure, children of God with all felt in this generation, for it's God who works in us to act and to will according to his good purpose. Why? In order that on the day of Christ, on the day of Christ, if Jesus would come back, Paul would say that I did not run or labor for nothing. In other words, looking back in retrospect, we can exalt and glorify God for what he has done. If God's at work in us, if God has our will, if God has our motivations, if God has our actions, then, then God will be glorified. Why? Because of what? He says this idea of running or laboring. Okay. The, the word here is actually trek. <laughs> you ever gone on a trek? <laughs> ever gone on a hike? You wanted to go from point A to point B? We call it a trek sometimes. That's the word that's used here. The, the journey. The journey that we're living the life that we're running along, the path that we're running along, and the hard work, labor. It was not in vain. We can glorify God, rejoice in God's will and work. On the day of Christ, we will know why we had to go, what we went through. So, looking back, who? Are you beloved in Christ? Yes, you are. We need to remember that as we as we work in fellowship with one another, as you have always obeyed. Where? With and without eye service, everywhere. And every when. How? Continue to do everything to cause the light of the word of life to appear. We shine like stars in the midst of this perverse generation and crooked generation that's right now twisting and manipulating God's truth to sort out its own misadventures and to make itself feel better and justify its sin. That's going on now. Why? So God gets the glory because his will and his purpose is accomplished in us as a result of our choice to obey. And then we get to verses 17 and 18 and cause much rejoicing because God's at work 
Look at what Paul says here. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, their testimony is part of what got Paul in trouble. People didn't like it because people were changing their lives all because of Paul's preaching of the gospel. He says, I'm glad I rejoice with all of you, so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Cause much rejoicing because God is at work when we are committed to, devoted to his will, his way in our lives. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for loving us so much that you sent Jesus to be our example of obedience. So Lord, help us to remember that we're very much loved by you. Help us to remember that as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, Lord, help us to be dependent on you, that we might shine the truth of the light of your word, that it might be seen by people who are walking in the darkness, that they might turn to you and understand what your will is for them and what work you want to do in their lives, ultimately to bring you much glory and that we all might rejoice together when we all get to heaven. Lord, we ask that you would dismiss us with your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.